Okay, here we go. Go. Well, hello, greetings. Uh, we are with here with here today with Matt Candace. Uh He's written and he's the author of the book Defense of Plants, and uh, and we've been having such a delightful time before the programming began to talk about uh, book his book and the personal reasons for it and how it engages the green thumb and the grower and person who finds it, you know, just a, a needful access to grow things. You know, if you're one of those people and you're always, you know, leaning toward green, <laughs> you know, which is a great place to be. So yeah. Matt, thank you, welcome, good to have you. Share with us a little bit about your book and the inspirations for your writing of it. Well, wonderful. Thank you both so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, my book is called In Defense of Plants, An Exploration into the Wonder of Plants. And it was written because I wanted to tell the world why plants are amazing and they're doing such incredible things because I want to inspire people to look at plants the same way they look at elephants or pandas or cheetahs, to look at them with the same awe and respect because plants are organisms fighting for survival. They're doing things in amazing different ways. And, uh, you know, I wanted to tell it through the lens of sort of my own personal journey, because like you said, this getting growing plants is, is a really important thing. Getting people interested in plants is also very important. And, you know, through growing plants, I learned to love them. And I think that's, uh, I, 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 at least I hope that comes through in the pages of this book. So. Okay. Very awesome. good. Yeah. I mean, power of plants and the defense of plants, you know, what? <laughs> you know, I mean, when you think about that kind of thing, you think about, you know, what plants do for us. And uh, what it can, what they can do, just like plants can serve as a tool, just like you know, I don't know, uh, um, uh, moss. They say always grows on the north side of the tree, which would be north. And so, the plant gives you directions consistently. I, I mean, you know, I mean, but when you think of it, I don't think there's a real actual analysis of the power of plants. We, we I mean, we like most of us like plant food you know, and uh, what it means and how it can serve us. But if you really delve deep into that aspect, what it can mean, what it, what powers you can access like that, you know, and the roadmaps. That's a good segue. So Matt, tell us a, five things that you think that plants could do for you if you took an interest in it. Well, I mean, first and foremost, they help you breathe. Uh, they take yeah. energy from our sun, they mix it with water and the CO2 gas that we breathe out, and they one of their waste products is oxygen. So that's amazing. Two is that is amazing? Wow, that's amazing. That's yeah. really amazing. Mm -hmm. Two mm -hmm. is that they connect you to the water cycle. They teach you how important clean, fresh water is because you can't water plants with salt water or dirt. I mean, they not necessarily really contaminated water, but they also help clean our water, which I think is a phenomenal thing. They pull it through their roots, they channel it up through their stems and release it back into the atmosphere as water vapor. So three, from that point, not only are they giving us fresh water, they're controlling our climate. They're helping by storing carbon in their tissues, but also respiring water back into the atmosphere. You know, in places like the Amazon, they create the rain. You know, without the, the, the plants, there wouldn't be the rainforest, right? Uh, four, they teach you how to be patient. You can sit and watch plants. You know, the old adage of watching grass grow is kind of a, an acronym for being, or an analogy for being boring. But at the same time, I think if you like took time to understand and watch how plants grow and behave, why they're doing well in some areas and not others, you get a sense of what's going on in your world around you. They teach you patience. They also uh -huh. teach us that being stuck in place isn't necessarily a bad thing. You know, there's trees that... Uh, will live for 3,000 plus years in a single spot. And it's sometimes in the harshest conditions in the world. So they can teach you to be patient, but also to just persevere and, and deal with the, the hardships of life. And like you said earlier in our conversation, come out on the other side, better new, better a better mm -hmm. personhood in the long run. But they also mm -hmm. feed everything. They support all of the food chains and webs that hold our planet together. If it wasn't for yeah. the energy that plants provide to microbes and insects and herbivores, nothing else on this planet could exist. So, you know, there, there really are the, uh, for me at least, and I hope I can inspire others to look at them as, as a connection to the living world. Mm -hmm. wow. You know, a friend of mine, he was a, a biochemist. He used to say that uh, when you burn, okay, let's say you cut a tree down and you burn it and you have charcoal, you should take that charcoal then and put it in your garden because there are 
and the tree because it's growing from the roots of the earth that will have medicinal benefits for you and they'll grow them through your garden. I know, I mean, I, I, it makes, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, because there are nutrients that we can't get. You know, uh, there was another fellow named Dr. Well, Wellam, I think. He did over 2,000 uh, uh, autopsies. And in his research, he determined that most people pass away from the lack of certain nutrients mm. and minerals in their diet. And you know, and there you, you can get them through the charcoal or the trees or the substance of what's left in those. So I mean, I, I know plants have the power to heal. I know plants have the power to heal. You know, and when you look at plants that are grown all over the world, all over the world, some I mean, we want there's some herbs and minerals, and vitamins that here in America we don't have access to. Right. But if we knew uh, we we knew where they were and what they would do we could get tremendous benefits from, I mean, that way. So, wow, the, the defense of plants. Now, now, when you say defense of plants, are you, you know, defending the plants or are you helping the plants defend us? <laughs> I mean, I, that's a great question. I, I think it goes both ways. The plants really do make our lives possible, whether we realize it or not. But I think the, the whole in defense of plants title and, and idea came from the fact that, you know, even within environmental circles, my friends that, that cared about the environment, they, they largely looked at plants as sort of boring. Uh, again, this, uh -huh. they, they don't get up and move. They don't do things like animals do. They operate on very slow time scales. And I think it was one of those realizations that as soon as you get to know them a little bit better and try to, like I said, take the time to understand how they you know, work in this world and make a living for themselves, you realize plants aren't boring. They're just doing it very differently. And so In Defense of Plants was born with my viewpoint is going, no, these aren't boring. They're actually very exciting. And I want to tell you how exciting they are. <laughs> uh -huh. a, a friend of mine, well, he is the game warden. I guess you could call him the game warden, as well as the environmental specialist for Tanzania. And oh, Kenya. wow. Yeah. And uh, he has come to the conclusion that uh, every year the migration patterns of a particular type of swan come to this lake, you know, and there are millions of the birds come. And he was talking about why they come, is there's an organism that grows from the, uh, I don't know, the, the lake itself. Hmm. And these birds love this particular organism because it defends them against the sickness. Hmm. And it gives them a healthy life uh, span. And, and so and it's a plant. And so, I mean, I, I was on a call with them, but I, the call was very limited, but I wanted to engage in that because, I mean, so, I mean, I think on the earth, there are plants that will heal us from just about anything or create the kind of titanium, you know, aura. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a little cynical, but it they give us a sense of health. And I mean, what if there's a plant that gets you back to your 90% of your unconscious mind? <laughs> It might be. I don't know. And that's true. Yeah, I, I know, mean, you know. And so, but, so you tell know. us about the book. What plants in the book do you talk about? Are you motivating people to grow plants or what is mm -hmm. the objective of the book? And uh, let's dive into the book a little bit. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the first few chapters are sort of my own journey into figuring out plants were amazing. And I largely did that through gardening. And I think, you know, my my emphasis there is by growing plants, you're getting to know them better, but you're discovering, like I said, different things out about the world around you, about how seeds move around, how plants reproduce, how they're defending themselves against environmental onslaughts, both living and abiotic. And so it kind of evolves from my personal journey into all of the aspects of plants that I was realizing were very cool. For instance, reproduction. I mean, there's so many plants that utilize very specific pollinators that you know, if that pollinator disappears, the plant can no longer reproduce. But then there's ones that just throw all of their pollen into the wind, giving us tons of allergies, but there's a whole spectrum of strategies there. Uh, and then I go into how plants disperse their seeds because plants can't walk around the landscape to conquer new territory. They have to send their next generation out, right? And so some stick, they get burrs that get stuck to your clothes or your fur. Others have little wings that they can fly like hang gliders. Others explode their seeds out into the environment. Uh, and then, you know, plants are also defending themselves, often in ways that would 
you know, if we tried them, we'd be sanctioned by the United Nations and rightfully so. But, you know, all of these medicines, for instance, all the like most, if not, I would argue the medicinal properties we get from plants, they're defense compounds because sure, plants sure. need to defend themselves from bacteria and fungi and sure. they don't want to be eaten. So a lot of those we have found a use for. And that's where I kind of go is use specific examples that I find very exciting and oftentimes unique, um, you know, because again, people would be very familiar with a, a honeybee visiting a dandelion or a daffodil and transferring pollen, but they might not be so familiar with, you know, the fact that mosses use these tiny insects in the soil called springtails to transfer their sperm from one plant to another. And just getting people to think about plants and look at them in a, a slightly different way than they'd get from, you know, the everyday examples that we hear. Right, right. You know, typically, you know, people, I mean, when you think about plants and you think only in terms of food, you know, and the, I mean, because a friend of mine, her mother is uh, going to be 100 in July. Wow. You know, yeah, 100. And the, fo the focus of where she's at, uh, and I asked her, I said, well, it's okay. As a little girl, what kind of food did you eat? Hmm. <laughs> I mean, because the foods have changed over the last 80, oh, yeah. 70, 70, 80 years. I mean, what we eat now is nowhere close to what, because 70% of the people, oh, 90% of the people ate, you know, 90% of homegrown foods, foods grown on farms, food, foods grown in the local environment. And there's some foods that have passed, have wasted away and, uh, and some foods have left and stayed and they don't mean us the best benefit. And, mm. you know, so, uh, and so in fact, uh, one of our authors that we've uh, worked with conclusively He's uh, concluded that uh, you can reverse diabetes. You can completely reverse it in eight weeks because wow. I mean, uh, a particular use of foods. So we have to protect the ones that give us the greatest benefit and push away the, those that don't. So your book has profound implications as it relates to diet, health, defending ourselves. And if we don't defend our plant-based model, then I mean, even the food that if you're a meat eater, you know, what food they eat. I mean, really, I mean, exactly. Yeah, totally. You know, you need to eat healthy foods and you need to feed them to do so. So this is a very important book, I think. Uh, yeah, and I uh, think this is a perfect time to buy Matt's book because uh -huh. it, we're still in the lockdown kind of where we are opening back up, but it's a perfect time for you to explore uh -huh. planting some plants uh -huh. uh, that are good for you and the environment. And so let's end this interview with telling us five tips Mm -hmm. that you think that people could draw from your book that would motivate them to grow plants. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're a corporation, you know, buy more plants, decorate your office. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're homeowners, you know, there's nothing like having plants. And even if you have a apartment or a studio, you could still grow plants. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so give us your tips and then show do, us your book. Do you grow? The book is available everywhere and we highly encourage you to buy do, it. Do you grow organic? Do you use organ yes. organic? Oh yes. Okay. Very yes. good. What are some of your What are some of your tools? Your, I mean, what do you What do you What's your What fertilizer do you use? Uh, we use a mixture. We'll use worm castings. We will use uh, seaweed juice. It's like a seaweed oil that you. It's an extract huh. from actual seaweed. Um, we use uh, compost tea. So the the juice. It sounds kind of gross, but the juices that come out of your compost are very good. Uh, and then you uh -huh. can buy various organic mixes of fertilizers that as long as you're getting the right mixes of nitrogen and phosphorus and calcium. Um, but yeah, okay. we, we use a lot of compost, which has a lot of good bacteria and microbes to help encourage better plant growth. Uh, but in oh, terms of good. tips, I think the first and foremost tip is don't be intimidated. Just try it. Something is going to work and you're going to fail a lot. And that's part of the process. You learn from those failures. And that's true through all aspects of life. My second tip is figure out what your average conditions are. Are you growing in a pot or are you growing in the soil? What kind of climate can you expect? Look at your average frost date, look at your average high temperature, low temperature. And there are so many great, especially heirloom varieties that have been bred for specific conditions and just do a little bit of research. Say, you know, tomatoes that grow best in cold climates or, uh, beans that grow well in clay soils. Just get to know your average conditions because that can really help you succeed a lot quicker. The third mm -hmm. is mix your crops. Don't just do one thing. Even if you have a patio, if you've got three pots to choose from, do three different things. Do a tomato, do a potato, try some beans. Uh, because if you just do one thing 
and your conditions aren't good for that one thing, you're probably not going to do as well as if you vary it up a little bit. And diversity across the board is the spice of life. You should be enjoying that as much as possible. Four is understand the soil you're starting with. Do a little bit of research, get good compost, like I said, because you're going to introduce good microbial activity, which helps the plants survive. And it'll add extra nutrients if you add worm castings and that sort of stuff. But a good soil mix that can drain, you know, add a little bit of perlite, that stuff that looks like styrofoam in the soil, get a good drainage, mm -hmm. get good, healthy, rich soil, and you will have really healthy, rich plants as a result. And then finally, five, add some variety of wildflowers to your garden planting because wildflowers will attract not only pollinators that will help pollinate your crops, but they'll attract all of the mm -hmm. beneficial insects that will then attack the, the, the pests that attack your crops. So for instance, we have a bad white fly problem every summer here in the Midwest and they drain our plants. They just suck the juices right out of them. But because we have a lot of other wildflowers in our garden, it attracts these things called lace wings. And when the lace wings lay their eggs in the garden, their larvae go out and they're little predators and they eat all the white fly. And so mix in, especially native plants that are indigenous to your area, and you'll be bringing in things like wasps and, and lace wings that will eat the things that are eating your garden. And it's, and it's connecting you to the ecosystem. You're not using harsh chemicals to do this sort of stuff. You're, you're reinvigorating the local ecosystem to work with you instead of working against it all of the time. A friend of mine told me that uh, uh, echoes what you're saying, suggested that I use sunflower seeds, plant sunflowers around the garden, and that'll attract, you know, the right um, uh, paradigm of, of bugs that will Perfect. eat the insects. Yes. Yeah, yeah, very good. Awesome. Wow, wow. Wow, so we learned a lot today. And uh, <laughs> we had a fantastic Earth Day uh, Zoom conference. And so this is in continuation of that. And we hope that you will grow many hobbies good for the planet, <laughs> good for you. And what better way than to do plants? So show us the book one more time. And this book is available everywhere. And we highly, highly encourage that you buy it and add it to your library and get cracking and start growing some plants. It's mm -hmm. the planting season mm -hmm. and what better time than now. Mm -hmm. You are watching brightsideglobaltrade.org and you will have all this information about Matt as well as where to get the book from in the link below. And if you do happen to buy his book, snap a picture and share it with us in the comments section so we know that you're watching. And uh, if you're growing plants, uh, take a picture of the plant and show it to us. And just for commenting, we'll give you two tickets to our next oh, Zoom conference. We're doing one every single month. And we give a lot of giveaways every single month. And so you will get a chance to win some of those giveaways. So if you're watching anytime in 2021 uh, and comment, we will give you two tickets to our conference. So stay tuned and look for us on brightsideglobaltrade.org. Uh, do you have a website or any Facebook or oh, Twitter yes. handles, Matt? Yes, In Defense of Plants. So indefenseofplants.com is the main site. That's where you can get access to the blog, the podcast, the stores. Um, I'm on Facebook as In Defense of Plants, on Instagram and Twitter as In Defense of Plants. Basically, if you look up In Defense of Plants, you will find me. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank and you. Thank, thank you, you for so watching. Thank you both so much.